What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the Vanguard Project Podcast. My name is Austin Jardine. Happy freaking Monday. I am super excited. Uh, I'm actually working on uh, getting this episode put together a few days in advance. It's actually a, uh, a Wednesday morning for me. I got up bright and early to uh, get this taken care of because uh, I'm headed out camping this weekend. I am uh, looking forward to a bit of a reprieve from the daily grind. So uh, I will be out and I'm super stoked and uh, hoping that uh, by the time I get a new episode put together, I've got some pictures and uh, some uh, some good info to uh, or good uh Good stories, I guess, to bring back to y'all. But before we get into it, um, for those of you maybe joining for the first time, uh, my goal here is uh, growth through story and strength through community. So what I mean by that is uh, I sit down with folks to uh, have them share their life stories with me in a way that hopefully uh, gets you excited or motivated or gives you something to chew on uh, kind of throughout your week or you know your daily grind or whatever the case may be to uh, help you uh, find some motivation or maybe think about life a little bit differently or uh, maybe you find a community to join in on. Uh, over the past uh, year now, uh, I've actually interviewed a ton of folks just from you know, photographers to law enforcement to military to um, artists and just an insane amount, coffee roasters, just an insane amount of folks. Um, so hoping to uh, give you guys just different insights and uh, sharing in their life story. So with that being said, uh, I don't really do a whole heck of a lot of talking. I think my intro and outro really kind of is, a, is about it for me as far as words go. Which is funny because lately I've been told I have all the words. But uh, getting into today's episode with Mandy, I'm very excited uh, because it was a lot of fun to sit down with her and kind of pick her brain and uh, kind of just some of the things that she's learned and been able to really understand and, you know, become more comfortable. And so I'm very excited to share uh, or have her share her story uh, on this platform. So, uh, you know, today's episode is, a, is, like I said, a lot of fun, but it's also sponsored by Everly Stock. And I'm super stoked because I'm actually headed out with some of the crew from uh, from Everly Stock this weekend. So if you haven't heard of Everly Stock, well, then you've probably just joined this podcast. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Everly Stock manufactures a ton of high quality camping, hunting, tactical EDC gear. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite pieces of gear is actually the bandit and their bandit is their little, uh, day pack. And it is like the perfect size for snowshoeing or, you know, day trips or just, uh, kind of your general hiking, or if you're headed into town and just want to carry snacks, water, or, uh, maybe some extra gear, whatever, whatever you might need. But, uh, their little H31 bandit is among my favorite. I think I have like three of them, which is I'm kind of ashamed to say, but you know what? They're all different colors and they all serve the same purpose for different situations. Uh, nevertheless, be sure to give call or uh, give Tucker a call at the retail store. I will have the, um, uh, telephone number, uh, in the episode description, but otherwise please like rate, subscribe to the show, follow me on the Instagrams because that's where I do a lot of my, uh, uh sharing all of my words. Um, uh, but we're going to stop chatting for now and I will catch you next time. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the Vanguard Project. I hope you're all having a wonderful day. Uh, Mandy and I are sitting here. It's a uh, it's late for you on a Tuesday, and it's getting a little bit later for me, and it's hot on both ends of uh, the states, I'm hearing, because you're you're over on the East Coast, and it sounds miserable, and I'm over here in Boise, and it's warm, but not humid, so I'm fortunate to, uh, to have escaped that. But anyways, Mandy, how are you doing this evening? Uh, doing really good. Um, hanging out with uh, my fam. Uh, I have two daughters and several roommates so we were all just hanging out we had a uh, make your own pizza night we were sitting down for a movie and and I got on here nice make your own pizza that sounds good did you guys do like a make your own dough and everything no we weren't that we weren't that yeah overzealous we uh, bought bubbly like already made stuff and just did the sauces and toppings and all that 
Nice. That sounds good. I had uh, two peanut butter sandwiches and now I'm back upstairs. So <laughs> can't go wrong with that. That's I know. What do. I know. Well, maybe to kick us off, it's a, uh, it's kind of funny because you and I met briefly last summer and then I was fishing for contacts uh, for folks to interview and Ashley brought your name up and uh, she got us connected. So I'm super excited to chat. So thank you. But yeah. to kick us off, do you mind maybe just uh, introducing yourself a little bit, who you are, what you do, and then I will badger you with questions as we go. Sure. Uh, my name is Mandy Thomas. I'm a firefighter in Northeast Florida. I'm also an EMT. So in our department, we do both the EMS side and fire. Um, I already said I'm a mom of two girls. And um, I used to do a ton of volunteering with nonprofits for veterans and first responders. But um, this year, I decided to take more time for my family. So I'm not currently doing that, but that's normally what I do. Okay. So maybe uh, to start, what led you down uh, the path of firefighting? I mean, is it something that you've always wanted to do? Did you grow up in a fire family? No, I'm the first in, in my immediate family. I was, uh, so I joined the army and I got out in 2006 um, when I found out I was pregnant with my first daughter and I was a stay at home mom for 12 years um, I've in that time I became a personal trainer. And so I've done that for 15 years now, but I still didn't really have a sense of purpose or service or anything. And my, uh, ex-husband at the time was in the fire service and, um, I decided, well, why not? So that's it. There's no like, oh, when I was a little girl, like this is what I know. I, I had no idea. I uh, never really even thought about it. Didn't think I could do it and trained up and really, really enjoyed it. And I'm not half bad at it. Yeah. So sense of purpose. Is that something that you've kind of carried through from starting in the army to maybe what led you into into fire or was uh, kind of the fire route? And I guess what I'm trying to think about, right, is you had mentioned a loss of sense of purpose or maybe not having the sense of purpose. Did you end up finding it again or did you refind it still looking for it? It's kind of a really broad, vague question. No, I, I gotcha. So I found it initially within the fire service, right? It gave me a job. I was able to financially contribute. It was super challenging. And now that I've been in it for four years, I have found that my sense of purpose is, um, uh, is my family. So I, you know, it's not that I'm, you know, I, I don't have a sense of purpose in the fire service. You can tell I'm ate up with it. I absolutely love my job. I feel lucky every day I get to go, but, um, when it's my time to go home, like I don't hang out with, you know, um, a ton of people from work. I'm super private, uh, which is ironic because how much I share on my social media, but I just want to be home with my people. So that's, it's, it's kind of like a give and take. Like when I'm at work, they have me at work hundred percent when I'm at home, like, don't call me, I'll call you kind of thing. Sure. Okay. So I don't really know. I don't think I've really talked to a whole lot of folks in the fire service. What does that, what does that entail look like in the pipeline look like to, I guess, become a full-fledged firefighter? So I'm, I'm not sure in the other States, but in the state of Florida, um, you have to at least be an EMT in order to be in the fire service. So I went to a combination program in a technical school, which was um, three and a half months of fire and three and a half months of EMT. And then you can start putting in your applications. So, and they also take medics. So that's another school that you can go to as well. Okay. Okay. So going through that then, um, I can only imagine how, like, it's funny because three and a half months doesn't sound like a long time per section, but I can imagine that's a nightmare. What well, I was an idiot because <laughs> I decided to go through fire school in July. Nice. In okay. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm a smaller person. Not only that, I was four when I went to the academy. So, um, you know, an old lady. Uh, luckily a fit one, but um, I have to tell you, I, in all of my military schooling and any schooling that I've ever done or anything physical, 
going through fire school was the most challenging thing because I couldn't control the weather and it was hot. Uh, we started with 18 people in our class and we only graduated six. So, yeah, we, uh, we were notorious for having people drop out for being heat casualties. And, you know, a lot of people had never put on the MSA mask before and gone into really hot building and they just couldn't stand the claustrophobia and decided, yes, yeah, this is not the right time for me. So there were a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges within the school, but I had to say that the heat was definitely the worst because we're in that bunker gear, you know, pretty much eight hours a day, right. especially the last few weeks of school. So I, uh, you know, instead of eating lunch, I would go in the locker room, just the girls locker room, and I would turn on the cold water and I would lay on the floor in the shower to cool off. Interesting. Okay. So with that many, that's what a 60, 70% attrition, no, that's more than that. That's like an 80% attrition, right? Right. For that class it was. Yeah. Yeah. So what kept you going then? I mean, to me, that seems like a pretty easy, easy thing to give up on. I, uh, it, it could have been, I, I'm, I don't quit things easily. Um, I, I also had a really hard time with a few people in my class and because they made me a squad leader, right? They like to do that with minorities in the class just to challenge them a little bit more. So I had to, you know, um, I think they were Air National Guards or Army National Guards or something. I just had a problem taking, um, you know, listening to a female in regards to doing things. And so they... Uh, it made my life a living hell. So one of the reasons why I didn't quit was just, you know, I, I wanted to live another day just to piss them off, sure. honestly. And, um, I just kept thinking, just get to the end of the day. That's all I would think about every single day was like, just get, just make it to five o'clock. Um, and then I had two little girls that, you know, are looking at their mom who started way late in life. You know, I spent 12 years making sure that nobody else care of them except for me um you know what would that tell them if I quit because I was a little uncomfortable okay okay so thinking about that one question or one thing that, that does interest me and I try to ask this in a meaningful way right but as a female in a what I believe a male dominated world right I can imagine mm -hmm. that obviously like you said is challenging what were some of the things that you learned struggled with or feel like other females could benefit from learning that you made it through with the knowledge of? Oh, great question. So the things that I struggled with is I believe I'm a, a good person with a good heart and my intentions will always be exactly what you see. There's no hidden agenda, no nothing. And, um, a lot of people, um, they just don't understand that. They think like, if I charge too hard, they think that I'm just, you know, showing off or I'm, you know, doing things other than just to do what I'm supposed to do and do it well. So I would say the most frustrating thing, and this still applies somewhat even now is I'm misunderstood a lot in my department. Um, you know, my social media, I focus a lot on the fitness aspect of the fire service because I've, you know, been a PT for 15 years. Um, and I've been accused of being like a show off and, you know, just, um, just somebody that really likes attention instead of doing it to help a majority of the people that, you know, they walk out into our bays every single shift and they have no idea what to do for a workout. We have all of this equipment, right? But nobody knows how to program anything. So that that was the most frustrating and still is the most frustrating part. Um, what I learned in fire school and I learned now is um, it's just work. And, you know, going through fire school, I just knew I had to get through it and I would set myself up for success. Um, but mostly in the fire service now is, you know, I'm lucky enough that I get to do this cool job. And, uh, but at the end of the day, I still go home to my family and I still go home as me. So it's just work. Try not to take it, you know, offense to too much, uh, which is really hard for me. Cause I'm, you know, I really, 
I really am genuine, I think. Um, and as far as females go, um, the only thing that I have, the only advice I've ever given to females in regards to the fire service is you either meet or exceed the standard, nothing else. Don't ask anything to be changed. Um, we're expected to work just as hard. Um, you know, I'm, I may not be able to lift, you know, what the other guys lift. Um, I can outlast them for sure. Um, but you know, you just don't ask for any change. You either do it and do it well, or don't do it at all. Yeah. Okay. So when it go, going back a little bit and I was taking notes kind of, as you were talking with the most frustrating thing being misunderstood, um, have you tried to, I guess, rectify that at all? Or, or are you just like, Hey, listen, this is exactly who I am and you need to make peace with that. Or are you trying to, I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily mending relationships so much as like facilitating relationships. Um, I have had to let it go because, okay. you know, there are certain uh, types of people that you just can't change no matter how the conversation goes. It's just, that's who those people are. That's who those types of people are. I'll, I'll get, I get to reach the people that I want to reach and I do reach staying the course. So I'm not going to change myself because there are a few people that, you know, have an issue with me. I'm, I'm okay with people having an issue with me. Cause I still, I still am doing it for the right reasons. My intentions are good. And, you know, I've, I've helped, I wouldn't say a ton of people. Cause that sounds, you know, um, kind of stuck up, but I help people enough that I'm just going to stay the course. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fair. And when you say it's uh, just work, what do you mean by that? So I at kind of the tail end, you said, Hey, it's just work. I, I come home. That's it. Lights off. Uh, well, I've had conversations with um, coworkers for, since I started this game. Uh, it, it, you know, the rookie year is definitely a game. Um, I came in later. So I didn't really have to be like coddled and handheld through the rookie year. Um, but people still had these outrageous expectations of me. Um, and I didn't know the rules. So I would get pissed off all the time because I didn't know how to play the game if I didn't know the rules. But um, what I have learned with, you know, talking to some people is that, you know, I just have to leave work there. It's, um, People can frustrate the shit out of you. The job can frustrate the shit out of you. There's a lot of things that are beyond your control. Um, that sometimes I want to say firefighters, myself included, take themselves a little too seriously. So um, what I mean by that is, you know, we don't fight enough fire, honestly, to think that we're I don't know, dragon slayers, right? We do a lot of EMS and that's all good. But, you know, when it all comes down to it, it's just work. We all get paid pretty much the same. We, all the expectations are the same. And it's your decision to show up at work that day with a good attitude or a shit attitude. And unfortunately, you know, some people show up with a shit attitude. Um, I choose to do the opposite because it's just work. Everything that is important to me is waiting at my front doorstep when I get home. Yeah. So, okay. <clears throat> How long did it take for you to kind of come to terms with it's just work? Um, and, and that's like a, a super loaded question, but I, I, I feel like a lot of people, and it took me a long time to kind of learn this too, is that, you know, when I close my laptop for the day, but that's it. Right. And, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. So how long did that take? And what did that look yeah. like as far as that process go for you? So I've been in the fire service for a little over four years now. And I probably had that mindset for about three or four months. Wow. Okay. Recently. Yeah. It's a while. So, yeah, <laughs> it's a long time. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, you know, this is a, being in the fire service, 
me personally, I'm not speaking for any other female, was pretty tough because uh, for one, I'm pretty athletic. Um, I can hold my own. I'll pretty much try to do anything much to my own detriment of my body. Um, you know, like I said, I don't have to be handheld. Um, I do have an opinion. I don't want to be dis disrespected, but there's a fine line between all of that. Like, how do you push yourself physically, but not push too much? How do you defend yourself and what you expect of respect, but not so much that you're, you know, you're burning bridges, you know, how do I present myself? Self as a as a female who wants to be in a male dominated profession, and I feel like I do it, you know, well enough. I certainly try my hardest, and I have a good crew that teaches me a lot, but not push so much to where people think like I'm trying to be a dude. Like it's it it can be really frustrating, and that's you know pretty much what I've talked to um, you know some coworkers about, and that's when it's just really the realization of, you know, you can only do so much. You can't change people's minds. They're just, you know, they're going to hold an opinion of you and keep it. That's the unfortunate side of the fire services. Once you earn a nickname, you have that nickname forever. You know, once you fuck up, you hold that on your shoulders forever. And, um, you, you know, my take on it is, you know, you just, at the end of the day, just go home and leave that there because it will certainly be waiting for you when you come back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I imagine you guys have seen your fair share of, you know, trauma and less than desirable and fun things. Um, how do you navigate that as far as like coming home and being able to sleep or not dwell on some of those things? Uh, it, this one was really tough for me at first. Um, I, I can remember the first time I messed up on that. I'm pretty good at, you know, if we have a cardiac arrest or whatever, and I'm pumping on somebody's chest, I'm not relating to that person. You know, I'm certainly going to do my best to do my job and help this person thrive. Um, and sometimes it just doesn't work. Right. Um, but I'm not like thinking of this person as like a son or a dad or a daughter or whatever. And this was, um, a couple of years ago and it was a, it was an overdose cardiac arrest on Festivus. So the 23rd of December and this, um, this guy had done some heroin with his mom and she went into room, her room to take a nap and he, went into cardiac arrest and fell right in front of the Christmas tree in front of all these presents. And so I'm pumping on his chest because I'm normally the lowest ranking. I'm, you know, we have a lot of medics in our department and I don't get to do the things that they do. They get to, you know, medicine and uh, drugs and all that stuff. So I'm normally just the person pumping on the chest or breathing for them. And so I'm pumping on this guy's chest and I'm looking like I'm looking around, not trying to pay attention to anything. And I start looking at the names on the presence, knowing like he's probably got a few under there and he's, you know, I mean, he was dead. He would, we had to call him on scene, but, um, that one was really difficult for me. Cause then I start to get angry. Right. I go home and tell my daughters, you will never do drugs. Like <laughs> drugs are horrible. Um, but then I had a friend tell me, um, I had called her cause I just couldn't wrap my head around it. People get themselves in these positions and you know, the shit that we have to see. And, um, she said, you know, if I could handpick anybody to be there when I was dying, I would want it to be you. She said, so think of what a privilege it is to have you there, you know, trying to save this person, doing the best that you can. And sometimes you can't. And it just instantly, like, like before that conversation was over, it completely changed my mind. It's, I'm just going to do the best that I can and, you know, no, be able to lay my head on the pillow at the end of the day. Um, so that's, what's worked for me. You know, there still are some horrible calls that I will remember for the rest of my life. 
um, you know, the first time I ever did a CP, did CPR on somebody with my hands, like physically touching them, because we have a device that we use in our department, was an eight-year-old little girl with autism. And my daughter has autism. So that was pretty terrible. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, we did our best. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then for as far as advice goes that uh, might be for folks that might be in the first responder world, is it is it really, at least from your experience and perspective, just to, to remember that you do do your best? It's, uh, I honestly don't think that's enough. I think people, you know, I, I really am big into mental health. If you follow me for longer than a month, you'll know that, you know, I, I talk about it quite a bit. I stress it. Um, I think that for first responders, military, but especially first responders, because that's what I've been in, you know, for a while now is it's more than just that. It's than just that shit call. It's, you know, your washing machine broke that day and your significant other called and wanted you to fix it, or at least bitch to you that, you know, the washing machine broke and you can't do anything about it because you're on shift. So that's stressful. Or, you know, it's, for me, um, people just need outlets. I think it needs, it needs to be bigger than that. It's, you need an outlet. You need to be able to talk about it with somebody that you trust. Um, you need to take care of yourself, you know, physically, you need to exercise. Um, so I think, you know, for me personally, just not being able to talk about it is, you know, the worst form of punishment. Cause it's like, you're swallowing poison every time you're not letting it out. You're just, right. you know, continually doing that. So very long winded to say that, um, no, it's, it's, that's not just the answer. It's, it's a big realm. Um, but it's part of it. You know, it was enough for me to know that, you know, I did my best and I work with amazing paramedics. Um, we're the best in the country. We have the best medical director in the country. So it's, it's enough, but not quite enough okay. to make that shit go away. Yeah. So maybe then if we could go down the, the rabbit hole of advocating for mental health then i mean talking mm -hmm. about kind of the outlet for talking to somebody trusting somebody the physical well-being right i mean how does that play into kind of your daily life and i guess your presence in this this world i guess you could say um that one's really tough because you know, being in the military, which is, was predominantly male dominated, you think of military, you think of a man, right? And then the same thing in the fire service is you're expected to toughen it out, right? That you're not allowed to be emotional. You shouldn't show feelings. Um, you know, just you signed up for this job, you should expect it. I think that's the most toxic attitude that anybody could have but how do you convince somebody that's been instilled with that um, otherwise? And for me, it's, you know, I understand that women are expected to be more sensitive, more open, more understanding, more of the mother figure. And I will play that role until my dying day. It's, um, to me, I feel like it's a responsibility for me to be able to be in a male dominated role, but also be a person that's um, willing to talk about it. I've talked about my own struggles, my own, um, I would say fantasies of suicide. I never like, um, I've never actually done it, but I damn sure thought about it and it felt nice, you know? Um, so I think that for me, it's, I can't save everybody. I can't convince everybody that I'm a safe place to come and talk to or to just be around. Um, I can, all I can do is just, just continue to talk about my struggles and um, let people know that I'm still here. I'm never going to stop talking about it. 
Um, but I think the realization is um, that men are taught to be the strong ones, the ones that hide everything, take care of everything, take the whole world on their shoulders. And I don't have an answer for how to fix that. So in talking about, and I'm trying to formulate this question as I talk, but as I guess in talking about your own struggles, thoughts of suicide, right? I mean, what has been maybe the most relieving thing for you in sharing your story? Has it, has it genuinely just been stopping to stop swallowing the poison like you'd mentioned, or, or has it, there been some aha moment that you've had where you're like, this is something that like, holy shit, I didn't know about. This is a, it's kind of a twofold question for me. The aha moment for me was when I scared myself. The first time I ever thought of, you know, writing a suicide note and, you know, trying to think of the cleanest way, you know, to do that. uh, I scared the shit out of myself. Um, And I called my Lieutenant at the time and said, Hey, I just, had this thought and I'm really scared. Um, and I just need somebody to hold me accountable. And he did. The problem with that is not a lot of people feel comfortable sharing something so intimate. It's to me, that's bearing your soul. And that's really hard for people to do, but you know, on my side, like I have two daughters that depend on me one especially my daughter with autism like she's going to be my buddy forever because she there's just you know she's probably just going to have to live with me forever so the thought of leaving her was too much but I think the shamefulness of having those thoughts is what keeps people from reaching out um for me like you like you had mentioned I no longer had to swallow that poison and then once I was able to share the situation that I was in and I got out of, I felt even more relief. And luckily I'm at a point right now where I don't even want to talk about that part anymore, the situation that I was in, because now that part's toxic to me. I'm over it. It's done. You know, I need to move on. The other part of that is I also realized that, um, I will say this, I was part of a nonprofit organization at the time that swore up and down that it assisted, you know, military and first responders with, um, suicide thoughts with rehabilitation from being injured. So we're talking like amputations and, you know, anything you could possibly think of. Um, And I was part of this organization for a few years and I reached out to them to say, Hey, I, I need some help. This is, you know, what I was just thinking. And I was the only female on the team at that point, they, uh, I was the only female veteran and also the only firefighter at the time. And they told me that I needed to go find help somewhere else because the person that I had the issue with was also part of that organization. So they protect their own. And I, was left on my own, you know, thank God I had, you know, the fire service part took care of me. And we're talking like it went up my chain of command for me to get help because I was acting like an absolute retard at work. I I'm lucky I didn't lose my job. Um, so they took care of me. But another thing that I have learned is that, um, to be very careful with the people you dedicate your time to, um, Cause they're, they're not all out to help you, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there was a lot there and yeah. um, maybe a personal question or two, and you can certainly defer um, mm-hmm. and we can change subjects, but you had mentioned, um, you know, having written a note and 
honestly a shame of having those thoughts and kind of feeling that way. And it's interesting because like, not to make it about me, like kind of what we were talking about, but when I was really handling my anxieties and my OCD, shame was the one thing that kind of I learned dictated a lot of what I had done. How did you get past the shame of those thoughts, like you'd mentioned, to ask for help? It was desperation. It was pure desperation. I had uh, I had nothing left. I was just a shell of a person um, due to, you know, I'll, I'll just say being in an extremely abusive relationship, I, you know, wasn't this happy go lucky person and this, you know, um, this positive person, I seriously was a skeleton walking around. And so once those thoughts popped in, you know, I can, I was able to at least function somewhat, um, you know, in order to survive for my kids and to keep my job. And uh, I was still volunteering at the time, ironically. Um, it, I just had nothing left. I was honestly just grasping at anybody that would be willing to take the time to listen and help and believe me. Okay. Okay. Then when it came to asking for help, right. And then working through the, the fire service chain of command, was that as easy as you would have hoped it would have been Were people receptive? Did it take some work asking if somebody's listening now that they're like, okay, yeah, I need, I need, I need guidance and help on moving forward. Luckily I knew that this one person, um, be there no matter what. Um, he is a person that has earned my respect through um, just being a good officer. Um, doesn't really, you know, bring emotion into play at work. I, I don't work with him now, but he's at a different station. But um, he was reliable enough for me to know that, you know, even though I didn't know him very well personally, that um, that he would be there. It's not easy. Um, it it was very embarrassing for me because I had a lot of things that um, I had to answer for um, that I had let slip at work. Um, but in doing that um, and just owning it and owning my situation and, you know, telling them, you know, I remember looking at my captain and it was like, my captain, my battalion chief, and my two lieutenants in the same room as me. And I'm just crying because I'm, I'm, I'm crying because I'm not quite out of my situation, but I know I'm getting there. Like I'm, you know, they're building my confidence back up. And I just looked at my captain, who's now a chief at the time. And I said, I just can't wait to be Andy again. And he looked at me and he said, I can't, I can't wait till you're you again too. And I, you were going to help you. Um, it was bearing my soul to them and taking responsibility for how I had, you know, fucked up. And I'm not saying like people that go to their chain of commands because they're having these thoughts are going to have to answer to anything. This was just my personal experience was that um, I was ready to put in the work because I, I, I just couldn't function anymore. I used to go to work to get away from the shit at home. And then the shit at home was following me to work. And that's when it fucked me up. So I just, I had to live. And for me, that was letting everybody in my direct chain of command know that um, I needed help. Yeah. It's a pretty powerful phrase to bear your soul to someone. I mean, thinking about it, I mean, it sounds, you know, fantastical, but I mean, I can relate to a certain extent, right? When you kind of hit a point and you're like, nothing is right. Everything's fucked right now. Yeah. Okay. So in that situation and coming out of it and becoming Mandy again, what, what, what are some of the things that you feel that you came out stronger for that you look back on you're like, I fucking did this and I feel good about it. And I ask again, in the same vein, that if somebody's at that same point, 
they have something to latch onto and look forward to? Um, I would say the one thing that means the most to me is um, a lot of stuff in my life that I used to count as a stressor isn't even on my radar anymore. Um, you know, it goes back to the whole the work is just work. Um, for me, it's if it's not life threatening to me or to anybody, you know, in my immediate circle, it's it's really not that important. Um, I've also learned that um, I am way stronger mentally than I ever gave myself credit to because I, you know, I look back and I'm like, I don't know how the hell you did it. Like, I remember uh, doing a workout with um, my boyfriend. <laughs> this is a funny story, but it, it's relatable. I was doing a workout with my boyfriend and I thought that he was intentionally ignoring me, which is a trigger for me. And so, um, I started, we were doing the same workout and instead of just like giving up and, you know, going into the house and forgetting about it, I started going harder and faster. Um, and I wanted to be like, okay, you know, I'm, a, I'm about to prove a point, but for whatever reason, I just enjoy that pain. And so I ended up killing him on the way out. And then, you know, we sat and talked about it after. And I was, I was like, Hey, this, this is what I was feeling. Like, you know, I felt like you were ignoring me, which he was in pain. He was just trying to get through the workout too. So it's not, he wasn't ignoring me. He was, you know, just in the zone. And, uh, I just, I've never cried over this person that I left. Um, and so th there was like no relief for me, but I ended up bawling my eyes out. Like I, I didn't even realize it was me, um, that was crying so hard, but I rem cause he was telling me this, it's not me. It's not what I was doing. I'm not him. That's not what was happening. Um, I started crying so hard because at that moment I felt sorry for myself for letting somebody treat me that way because I felt it in that moment like it was so triggering I instantly felt like somebody was pretending I was invisible just to torture me and um it was very healing you know obviously we got through it and luckily he's you know man enough to sit in the shit with me and say no this is not how it is but it was just, um, it, it was just a healing experience for me to know that, you know, I'm, I'm strong enough to have expectations of how I expect to be treated and never let somebody put me in that position again. That's pretty powerful to, I'm like processing, thinking about this because to be able to sit down and not allow somebody to make you feel a certain way, I think takes a whole lot of fortitude, which does not come easily. Like that's not freely given to anyone. Right. I think, like I said, I honestly don't know how I got through it. It was, you know, almost two years of that. And um, yeah, other than just, you know, like you said, attitude. Um, I hate talking about this, by the way. I always, you know, I always hate it when I'm in it, but I know it will help somebody. And that's the only reason why I'm allowing this. Um, <laughs> because it's still just, I still feel sorry for that girl. So it's, uh, yeah, it's like, you know, bearing a little bit of my soul again. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can, we can change subjects, but I appreciate you sharing because absolutely. It, I mean, I felt it too, thinking about it. I mean, I definitely started reflecting a little bit, you know, so <laughs> I think, I think editing this and listening to it again, I'm going to be like, shit, I'm going to start feeling stuff again. So. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. So maybe I know that it's getting late for you. I feel like we've covered a handful of things and skipped over a lot. 
um, in kind of your life experience, like I know we didn't even touch on military or uh, becoming a personal trainer. We didn't even talk about any of that, but I guess in kind of your life experience or volunteering, being a mom, kind of navigating and balancing all of these things. I mean, is there anything that you feel that you'd like to share or maybe that you've learned that you're like, Hey, I've learned that this is super helpful for me that others might benefit from too. Yeah. Um, I, I really like being positive. Um, you'd have to get me really, really riled up for me, you know, to see, if, you know, the shit part of me or, you know, somebody that's angry or holds a grudge. Um, so my biggest, what I would want somebody to take away from, you know, my story, if that's what you want to call it is don't stress about the stuff that you cannot control people's opinions, um, work, um, a bad day, only worry about the things that you can control. If it's not within your immediate control, don't give it any extra thought and it will save you and it will save you stress. You know, I used to get so anxious. I, I would make myself sick. I actually thought that I had like, I was developing Parkinson's cause I used to get hand tremors. I was stressed out so much. Um, so I, that's just, you know, do what makes you happy and don't worry about that other shit. Cause you know, people project a lot and, uh, it, it really frustrates the shit out of them when they see happy people happy. So <laughs> that's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, I don't want to stress you out and I don't, I know that this was probably a little <laughs> emotional, you know, and I don't want to like keep just badgering because I feel like You're I have good. a lot to learn from you, but maybe uh, another night we could get back together and chat some more. I don't know if there's anything tonight that you want to talk about anymore or, or get out there, but I also want to be respectful that you probably got to work tomorrow. You got kids and I know that you're, it's getting late for you. So. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you asking me on here. And, and like I said, I, there's nothing that I enjoy about telling my story. Um, it, uh, you know, it, it makes me feel very vulnerable, especially after like, I'll probably, you know, have to come down a couple hours after this, but um, I'm all about helping people. And if, if it helps people in any way, then, you know, it's, it, it's just how it has to be. But, um, I do want people to know that, um, I know that I am more than that. I'm more than that situation. I have so much more to offer, you know, than just that girl that was in that bad situation. Um, and, um, so are they, but, um, you know, I think unfortunately they're going to have to get desperate enough to, to say, okay, well, me getting help is way more important than the shame that I feel because I, I don't think that I'm supposed to be feeling these feelings, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's worth it. It's a lot of fucking work to ask for help. Uh, it took me seven months to actually leave that really after I, you know, raised my hand and said, I need help. But, um, I feel like life has just begun, you know, life began the day that I walked out that door and drove away and, um, it keeps getting better. Like, I don't know what I've done to deserve such a good life, but it, it, it's getting better. Good. Good. I like that. That's a good way to end it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mandy. I appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Thanks for tolerating my long <laughs> Of course. <laughs> Mandy, once again, thank you for taking the time to sit down and share your story with me. I enjoyed uh, getting to know you and uh, sharing in some of the life, less, life lessons that you've uh, come to know and uh, can articulate. So thank you. Everybody listening, I hope you all took some good information away. Uh, maybe got something to chew on throughout the rest of the week. But otherwise, I'm going to finish up my work day because it's, uh, it's just about to start. And uh, I will catch y'all next week.